I'm DC. And I'm Michael. And you're listening to the Monster Guys Podcast. Laughing epidemics and dancing plagues are two things that merely scratch the surface in our conversation today about mass psychogenic illnesses. Welcome back to the Monster Guys podcast. Michael, it was just a couple of weeks ago that we had great conversation with Jesse Fivecoat from Encounters Podcast. Uh, just prior to that, a conversation with his co-host, Eleanor Haskin, talking conspiracies and aliens and Illuminati and just all kinds of bizarre stuff. It was a conversation that was carried over even as far back as September on the Monster Guys podcast. So if you didn't hear those conversations, I urge you go back and check those out. Go back to Strange September and listen to that. And then our conversation with Seth Breedlove. And then, of course, we did uh, the series Monsters Among Us through October about real life monsters in our world. And then November, we continued our conversation with Ellie and then Jesse on just some really bizarre topics. But it was a lot of fun. And a lot of people are raving about those episodes. And and we're real happy to have had the opportunity to chat with them. Uh, But going forward... We've got some cool stuff. Today, we talk mass psychogenic illnesses, really bizarre stuff. We've touched on one of these in the past on the Monster Guys podcast with the dancing plague. If anybody remembers that on one of our segments, we used to call Tales of the Unknown. We went into some depth about that. We'll talk about more of that again today, as well as laughing epidemics and and their role in our culture and their effects on our society. Fantastic. Fantastic conversation coming right now. I love MPIs or mass psychogenic illnesses. They're bizarre and they're not fun (laughs) in in the way that, uh, you know, you don't want to experience them. But it's fun to look back on and think, you know, this is something interesting that the human mind does. And it has a monstrous quality all to itself, Uh, whether it is something that's caused by something physical or, or otherwise, it's monstrous. Well, it is. And some people may say, well, what do mass psychogenic illnesses have to do with monsters? Uh, The Monster Guys podcast. Well, let me tell you, folks, one of the things we'll talk about today is believed to have stemmed from the bite of a spider, a spider bite. And let me remind everyone that there is no more foul beast on this planet than the spider. Even though that this specific species of spider is actually pretty harmless? You are incorrect. There is no such thing as a harmless spider, Michael. Okay. Right. It, listen, <laughs> I don't care if the fangs don't get under the skin. I don't care if it's only rumored to be vicious bites and they're really harmless on the surface. The emotional toil... The psychological breakdown that spiders cause human is more dangerous than their bite. They are some of the most feared and fearsome monsters ever known to mankind. I think it's misplaced, but I I don't think I can argue with you there. Well, you can't because you would be (laughs) wrong to do so. I have personal experience (laughs) with these things. (laughs) And I know a lot of of other people who have personal experience with spiders. I have been there for some of those experiences. Oh, my gosh. Just ask my friend in high school who got a hammer dropped on top of his head because of the pain caused by him is evidence that these things (laughs) are meant for evil. They are on this earth to terrify mankind. That's all that needs to be said about it. (laughs) Okay. But spiders notwithstanding, in 2018, we're going to go even deeper in our content for you. Michael, we've been talking about this for a bit now, but uh, even going back to the origin of the term monster, the Latin root of that word literally means to warn or something of a sign a symbol or representation. And it's where we get a lot of 
the physical descriptions and even manifestations of popular monsters that we talk about, they stem from a warning or an omen or a sign. And we're going to go back to some of that legend and lore and some of those root concepts uh, from the word monster in 2018. We're not going to abandon monsters, vampires, werewolves, Sasquatch, and dogmen. We've covered a lot of cryptids in 2017, and we're not going to abandon that, but rather we're going to deepen that, I think, with some of the things we're going to dig into. And I'd like to point out as well, um, another definition of that, that Latin root talks about an aberrant occurrence in nature, oftentimes physical, but it doesn't always have to be a physical creature. Sometimes it can be something that is just wrong or something that uh, shouldn't be happening the way it is. And sometimes that doesn't even mean that it has to be evil, but it's something that we should pay attention to and learn from for the future. And I think that gets a lot deeper than some of our cooler, you know, vampires and werewolves and like you said, Dogman and Sasquatch. Yeah, it does. And especially at the surface level, we're not saying that those things are not deep and meaningful because right. they are. And we've enjoyed covering those, but we want to take it, uh, like you said, even further, even deeper. So look forward to some cool content in 2018 based on some of those root definitions and those origin stories, if you will, of what we know to be monsters in the world today. Also coming, uh, Michael, we've got a cool little mini series that we're going to jump into starting next week. Won't say much about that. I'll leave it as a surprise. But one of the other things that we have coming in just a few weeks is our annual Honorary Monster Guys induction. A lot of people on the podcast don't know that we do this because most of what we've done in past years has been through our live events. When we're out on the road speaking and doing shows and, and presenting and special events, but we've always inducted a group of people who we feel really represent what we're about as the Monster Guys. And whether they've significantly helped us in what we're trying to accomplish, or they just represent in their own lives or their own actions what the Monster Guys are all about, we've always had groups of people inducted each year into what we call the Honorary Monster Guys. A couple of years ago, uh, we had our first females inducted, and so we kind of said it was the Monster Guys and Gals, and some of the gals just wanted to be called Honorary Monster Guys, and some of them wanted to be called Honorary Monster Gals. So we just let them call themselves whatever they wanted to call themselves. <laughs> Didn't bother us. But we have another list this year of inductees that we're going to be excited to announce in a few weeks. Those inductions have always come with some pretty significant perks. Like I think our last group got some crowns to put on their head, some stickers, and I think tattoos. Now, you're forgetting some of the more valuable pieces, the uh, the shiny plastic medallions. Those were... Yes, they were plastic, but they were very shiny. They were, I mean, they, they blinded me once or twice. It was pretty powerful experience to place those around the necks of honorary monster guys and gals. So those perks will happen again for honorary monster guys. And we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that this year because we're not out on the road and doing this live, but we've got some really cool people that we're going to honor as honorary monster guys because of some really special and significant things that they've done in the past year that we feel either represent what we're about or represent what life should be about in their deeds and words and actions. So um, look forward to that in just a few weeks. We'll be excited to announce the 2017 Honorary Monster Guys. First time ever on the podcast, I believe. It's something that I think we haven't mentioned a whole lot, actually. Uh, I, I know we've talked about it here and there, but it's yeah. exciting to bring this part of our world to the listening audience. It is. So here we go. Mass psychogenic illnesses, Michael. Where do we start? First of all, let's, why don't we go back, way back in the beginning of the Monster Guys episode, we talked about the dancing plague. Let's review that one a little bit, because that one is always a fascinating topic for me to hear about. But let's start there, and then let's go into these laughing, laughing epidemics as well. 
This was a uh, actually kind of a interspersed segment that we did a long time ago that got a lot of interest, but it, again, wasn't like a monster back then, so it wasn't our main focus. But a long time ago on the podcast, we talked about something known as the Dancing Plague, which happened in 1518. It started with a woman named Frau Trophier, I believe we determined Frau her name to Trophier. be. Frau Trophier, yes. And uh, it was pretty crazy. Uh, she ended up just dancing on the street corner. Um, And when I say dancing, I mean she was erratically throwing herself around. Yes, if I remember correctly, I deemed this the first case of gothic dancing in the world. Right. (laughs) Because I always loved going to the gothic clubs and this whole dancing plague thing reminded me of watching a whole bunch of goths dance to their favorite band on the weekend in a darkened room. They have a, a very unique style of dancing and i say unique because i i don't think i don't <laughs> i'm trying to think of how to say this and not sound mean about it because i are I you talking about the dancing it. plague or are you talking about the gothics goth dancing goth dancing is awesome it Michael. is awesome I'll it's just very leave it artistic <laughs> and very wispy <laughs> wispy is a good word for it we're, we're, and very free we'll go with that uh frau trophy is dancing was not so wispy it was actually physically straining unfortunately for her yeah but the the weird thing about it is other people started gathering around her and started dancing with her and these people would dance for hours and sometimes days upon end until they collapsed dead some from strokes heart attacks some from uh, sleep exhaustion It was a very strange occurrence, and this was not something that they wanted to do, like they weren't happy about it. We'll talk about another MPI later on where people were actually, you know, enjoying the dancing, although it was a a mass hysteria moment. But in this particular case, they were actually fearful. They were shown to want to stop, but they felt like they couldn't stop. And so they danced until they literally died. Yeah, they yeah they danced themselves to death. It was just bizarre. Now, we had talked about different things that might have caused this. One of the longest standing theories was a particular type of mold upon the bread of the time. It was said to have caused this erratic dancing behavior. But a historian kind of closely looked at that and said that that couldn't be because that particular type of mold, I guess, caused erratic behavior, but didn't cause coordinated behavior. And this dancing plague was too coordinated. So that's out the door. The reason we bring this back up is because one of the the strongest theories was that this was a mass psychogenic illness or a a moment of mass hysteria where people had some sort of mental suggestion going on that they just went nuts. They couldn't control themselves anymore. So imagine a magic show like the stage shows or a hypnotist show, but on a citywide scale. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever been to one of those shows where you you bring a bunch of people up on stage and through the power of suggestion and of course the expectation of entertainment and everything else mixed into that, you have people acting like animals or doing silly things under hypnosis or under suggestion. Imagine that on a mass scale, but there's no magician involved. There's no hypnotist involved. These people, something triggered it and entire villages, entire cities, entire groups of people come under this spell, if you will. And the results are sometimes like the dancing plague unto death. Other times are just completely oddball. Uh, And some, you know, affect not only adults, but also children, which is interesting because in the study of hypnosis, the suggestibility of children is something that's under very close scrutiny. So when you have something like this MPI or this mass psychogenic illness that's affecting all age groups, it seems to go beyond just a parlor trick. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, a lot of that hypnosis on stage, it's embarrassing, but it's generally benign. Mm -hmm. This definitely is not. And I think a lot of it where suggestion is based on something, and correct me if I'm wrong, but hypnosis you know, it's based on something that you want to do or something that somebody might suggest that you want to do. You can't, you're not going to do something that you don't want to do. Yeah, at its common level and its purest level, it's permission-based. And and we're not going to go into that discussion on this episode, but hypnosis, whether it's hypnotherapy or even just as a part of an entertainment venue, is based on the permission that the participant gives to the hypnotist or the therapist. Right. And I'm 
pretty sure Frau Trophy did not give anybody permission to dance to yeah, dance I don't her think to death. So. So, I don't think that happened. Um, we're talking about something that is more based, more likely, on fear. And it's an interesting topic, this idea of fear versus the desire to do something that we'll get into later on in this episode, because we see some crazy stuff happening in some, shall we say, movements in the 1900s mm-hmm. and uh, up until this day. But for this particular v- dancing play, like I wanted to go back to 303 AD during the time of St. Vitus. St. Vitus was martyred in this year, and I guess associated with his death, there was this curse. I don't know why this curse was in place, but it was specifically saying, you know, that people would come under this dancing attack, if you will, if certain things were not adhered to. Some people would call it witchcraft, Michael. Witchcraft is at play in the dancing plague. It just, it always struck me as odd that it's specifically dancing. Like most curses that you see in movies or TV shows or books have to do with, I don't know, people rising from the dead, your jaw falling off, you know, crazy stuff like that. But no, this is a dancing plague. Yeah. (laughs) So now it's interesting to note before this outbreak, if you will, in 1518, there are other events. One big event happening in 1374. I think they called that choreomania of a similar event where people were afraid of this curse going on. So they started dancing and they had this uncontrollable urge to dance without stop. In 1518, it happened again, and many historians are now looking back and thinking that because of the area and because of some of the the famine and the the floods and crazy events going on at that time, people were afraid that they were just cursed by this holy saint. And then that led to this mass group of people dancing because of they, they knew the legend, they knew the story. But it started with one, it just dancing one. on a street corner, and she danced until she died. Yeah. So, but you were saying it wasn't the moldy bread. We talked about that theory before, and there are moments, there are movements, or, or uh, what, what shall we say, episodes of this kind of stuff happening historically that do involve drugs, that do involve some form of mind-altering substance that is taken or released upon a people or what have you that causes a mass illness or a mass reaction. But in the case of the dancing plague, historians are saying probably not so much. Probably not so much. But you know what? I would like to actually go back and say maybe Frau had some of that mold. We're going to talk later about sympathy and how that plays. Or maybe she had something else. (laughs) Maybe. We're going to talk later about sympathy and how that plays into some MPIs, how uh, people can be sympathetic to somebody experiencing these symptoms so they themselves take on those symptoms. Perhaps Frau did have some of that moldy bread and then other people saw her, felt sympathetic toward her, and because they knew the legend, perhaps there's a multiple, perhaps there are multiple causes going on that led So one to person thing. could be under the influence and then the other person joins into that on an emotional level and then it becomes a spiritual thing and before you know it, goth dancing is born. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Something like that. We've talked about this before. Um, this is the, the dancing plague of 1518. Yeah. Uh, what we have not covered before is Tarantism and the Tarantella. Here's where the monsters come into play. These spiders, dadgummit. <laughs> we have spiders in the world. They're meant only for evil. They are the cause of another dancing epidemic. This one lasted a lot longer, too, from the 15th to 17th century, and then we had minor outbreaks, I guess, in the 1940s and 50s, if I remember correctly. See? (laughs) See what spiders have done to mankind? But they also brought us the Tarantella. Demons from hell. This is an MPI that actually had a a kind of beneficial side effect, if you will. I think I'm going to get in trouble from Dee Dee Cheney over at um, FolkloreThursday.com because I, I believe she loves spiders and love studying them. I believe she she feels as though they are benevolent, kind creatures and they're they're pretty cool. Some okay, of them, okay, whatever. Some of them are not. The Brazilian wandering spider, I that can that can leave the earth. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> okay, so let's let's take this to to start with a name. So Tarantism is this dancing epidemic. All okay, but Tarantism. Let's connect the dots there. Tarantism, tarantula. Tarantula and Toronto. Toronto. Now, we're not talking about Canada. We're talking about Italy specifically in in this one. Toronto, Italy. But it all means the same thing. 15th century Toronto. (laughs) 15th century Toronto. 
It is a seaport city, and there's a specific type of spider there. It's actually a wolf spider. It's not even a, a modern day tarantula, but it a is a modern day tarantula. As if it, was there a difference between the ancient tarantulas? And... Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's the thing is, it was called a tarantula. But this but... wasn't a tarantula, though. It was actually classified as a wolf spider. Yes, but that that's the name that they gave it because it was you know common to that that city, I guess. So from Toronto, they called it tarantula. Listen, wolf spiders are all into themselves horrifying. I like wolf spiders. The wolf spider is actually what caused my initial fear of spider. I thought that was a banana spider. No, it was the it was the wolf spider, but of course wolf spiders in Florida, I mean, size of a freaking kangaroo in Australia. I mean, it it's I mean, they're they're terrifying. I don't know kangaroos get pretty they're kaiju. Pretty buff. <laughs> wolf spiders in Florida are kaiju. Is that the they one with fight the, uh, the alligators? Is that the one with the glowing red eyes? Yes, that is the that is the one of the story of the glowing red eyes in my room at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's understandable. Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> so, Terrence is <laughs> tarantulas, wolf spiders in Italy causing a dancing plague. Yeah, so they believed that this spider had a deadly or very dangerous bite and that this bite would cause you to sit up as if you'd been asleep and then you were suddenly bit by a tarantula was, I guess, how some of the sayings went. But it would cause you to get up and start to randomly convulse, throw yourself on the ground, have a lot of you know physical issues. I do that just at the sight of them. <laughs> I don't need to be bitten. Maybe you should try dancing it off then. That is, that's what they thought fixed it. They thought that with all of this convulsing and everything, that dancing would allow them to sweat out the poison. Yeah, by the way, side note, folks, if you hear rumbling or some odd noises in the recording tonight, it's because the earth literally is shaking around us right now. I, I guess we have some storms passing through, but it feels like the combination of a very violent thunderstorm and earthquakes right now. And it's literally shaking even sometimes the table and the floor. Maybe and it's a spider apocalypse. Maybe. Uh, well, there we go. But Please no, I... continue with your spider story. <laughs> okay. So this wolf spider, what they called a tarantula at that time, was thought to have caused this thing. People would start to dance in the streets because, because they believed... they thought this was the cure. Yeah. They yeah. believed that this was the healthy way of getting it out, just to sweat it out. But what happened was people would start to bring drums and flutes out into the street and play this music to go along with the dancers. They would basically encourage them to dance, which I find fascinating. You have this pretty traumatic event happening elsewhere in Europe, you know, something that's happened in multiple locations and in entire time periods, you have this happening again and again. And in Italy, they're, you know, they're making it a, a fun thing. Um, they're bringing out instruments and they're getting together. One folklorist recorded the event saying that they actually joined hands and started to dance to what started out as kind of a calm, soothing beat, and then it picked up pace and kept on going to a little faster and faster and faster and faster. It's called demonic possession, <laughs> Michael. Person becomes possessed by this demonic spider. Next thing you know, you've got the devil's music being played in the streets. People are holding hands, twirling about with the Pied Piper, and he's leading them all to hell. <laughs> That's what this is all about. I don't think they took it that way back then. But, it's because but they maybe. were delirious. They were possessed. Of course they didn't take it like that. But um, so the music back then was characterized as being very shrill. But it was a popular event. and, and you But get... flutes and drums back then, mm -hmm. which then actually evolved into something that's a whole genre of music today. Yes. Actually, the I think it's the theme song, or it's one of the famous songs from the Godfather series. Yes. That is a tarantella. That is something that uh, would be danced to. And here we go with another term, the tarantella. That's the genre of music that is described that has evolved over time from this tarantism and this dancing plague epidemic. The music and the dance itself as well, yeah. which it's pretty cool. I, I went on YouTube as soon as I found out about this going on, and I, I looked up some of those dances, and it's it's a pretty cool tradition still. Good thing we have YouTube. <laughs> 
but that's that's the interesting thing is this this particular MPI actually led to something new being created in the world and not having a terrible effect for once. Well, drugs do that often, and so do <laughs> demonic possession episodes, I guess. Now, here's the interesting thing. Perhaps part of the reason it's been beneficial is because people actually started admitting that they had never been bitten by this spider when they were going to dance in the streets. It became such a big thing and there was a, a case of mass hysteria going on but I think it evolved past that to where people were just getting together and dancing and enjoying it and they were probably using the excuse of a spider bite in order to let loose a little bit in what was probably not the best period of time in history 15th to 17th centuries yeah so that's a bit on the Tarantella and uh, where we come from. Well, describe describe a little bit more the modern evolution of Tarantella, the musical style. And also you were telling me about how sometimes the musician and the dancer try to compete with one another in performance. Yeah, again, I think that's really cool. The, I enjoyed this part because it it's heavy folklore. It's, um, you know, mm -hmm. where did this come from? Where did it go? Today, I guess it's danced with uh, a variety of different instruments. It includes the mandolin um, and still uses drums, tambourines, flutes, but it is characterized whereas... Violins. Yeah. Back then, you know, it was very shrill, very erratic, upbeat. Today, it's still very upbeat, but it has a very catchy rhythm to it. The other part of it is um, sometimes the dancer will compete with the musician. So they kind of try to one up each other, almost like a, a dueling piano skit but actually being played out by the dancer and the musician. Which then also kind of lends backward to the frenzy of the dance, mm -hmm. the frenzy of this curative response to a uh, mythical spider bite, but it was the frenzy and the sweating it out and, and the intensity of the dance. And here now, instead of an epidemic or a spider bite, what we have is just a social evolution and dancing and music, but those things teeing off with one another to create even more intensity and more frenzy in that experience. But a frenzy with style and yeah. kind of a, a beautiful dance as it's well. Kind of like jazz. Yeah, actually, it's yes. Frenzy with style. So that's um, that's an interesting part. But I do want to I do want to step back and say real quick, wolf spiders have been shown to, as far as the bite goes, the only thing it does is causes uh, like swelling and itching. Even the, the more dangerous, uh, the two more dangerous species that were touted in South Africa and Australia that uh, were said to have caused necrotic damage, they actually, in several case studies, have done nothing more than uh, what a bee sting would do. So You keep trying to tell yourself that. <laughs> Nobody believes you that these spiders have little to no effect. Let me tell you a story. I was in high school and my sister's cat had kittens up in the awning over the front door, like on the front porch part of the house. That's a weird place to have kittens. Yeah. So I hear these kittens meowing up there and I think, oh no, you know, you're in Florida. It's hot. They're going to die. They're going to suffocate or cook up there. So my friend and I were over and hear this together. And I said, well, let's get a ladder and we'll get these kittens out. So I had to get a hammer to pry open the awning to get them down. Well, when I reached up with the hammer to pry open, a wolf spider crawled out onto the hammer and toward my hand. I proceeded to violently throw the hammer downward, intending that the spider would go with it and <laughs> die in the fall. Instead, well, the spider probably fell, but the result was the hammer violently fell on top of my friend's head, who was holding the ladder for me. <laughs> <laughs> and injured him and it was it was horrifying i mean i hurt my friend <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> because of this spider that crawled. Listen, I don't care what you tell yourself. These things are dangerous. So was there an outbreak of hammer throwing in Florida? No, but we were running around the yard. He was cursing at me. <laughs> I was trying feverishly to console him and see if he was going to die. If he had cracks in his skull, I didn't know what was going to happen. It was a frenzy and we all lived eventually, but it was a horrifying experience. Hey, listen, have a wolf spider release its babies in front of you. 
Like when you're, okay, another story, front door. It always happens, seems to happen to the front door or in my bedroom, three o'clock in the morning. Or in the car. Front door, there's this huge spider and I was afraid to go through the door because it was right over the top of it. So I tried to shoo it away to get into the door. Well, I didn't know it, but this was a mama spider. There had to be hundreds, nay, thousands. There had to be thousands of these babies on her back. It was at least hundreds. Uh, yeah, I, I and have they to agree there. went every. It was like an apocalyptic vision unfolding in <laughs> front of me. I stumbled backward. I fell and I died. <laughs> and they resuscitated me later. I'm pretty sure. And I came back to life. Almost certain, but it brought <laughs> death in the moment. Have you ever had a mama wolf spider release her babies in front of you? I have. Oh my gosh. In the driveway, I have. And I, I have to agree that that part. Overhead. Not... So these things are like spread. It's like Lovecraftian almost <laughs> in its process and its reach. No, not not quite that bad, but I have to agree. I, it's not a that that's not a pleasant sight. I don't have any trouble with the spiders, but I, I so don't. don't ever tell me that spiders and particularly wolf spiders are not dangerous. They don't ever have to bite anybody to kill them <laughs> or to cause severe emotional and physical trauma. They just have to appear. Perhaps that's what happened back in Toronto. It may it may have been. It may have been. So we have this dancing plague that's created because of alleged spider bite that is later recanted and it was just kind of an emotional response that created this frenzy that spread but there are others that are even more interesting to uncover what about the laughing epidemic that is to me one of the most bizarre for the simple fact of how well documented it was as far as the spreading goes um it only lasted maybe about 6 months i, I it lasted longer than that but that's as long as the medical journal at the time was able to record and unfortunately i've not been able to find any follow ups to that publication which was published in 1963 but basically as the Central African Medical Journal dictates, on January 30th, 1962, three girls from the Kashasha boarding school started laughing uncontrollably. I'm not sure if it was due to a joke or to some stressful thing happening, but they could not stop laughing. They would have respite, but they would have these violent fits of laughing uncontrollably, which would sometimes turn into crying and then sometimes into fits of anxiety in which they would describe this sort of paranoid notion that people were after them or people were going to chase them. And this is a continuous experience. It is. Where they start laughing and this this whole thing just kind of melded into one another the longest recorded case of this happening and this was all kind of in the same area at first um, but the longest case of this happening was over a period of 16 days in one person 16 days of laughing crying and paranoia just complete hysteria that's two weeks it's yeah. longer than two weeks it yeah. sounds like it sounds like hell my gosh now Sometimes people would only experience this for a couple hours. I think the average that the medical journal gave was seven days. So on average, people experienced this for seven days once they contracted this disease, if you will. And this started in a school. Yep, the boarding school. And it's school. believed by some that this was started due to the stress and the pressures of that educational system, testing and study that was just kind of, I mean, very rigorous, but beyond that. Yeah. Now, I guess, again, I had a lot of trouble finding sources beyond this medical journal. There are a lot of people who recount this tale, but this medical journal reference some other happenings and they said you know there was one similar occurrence years ago but they were not able to i guess they just didn't give the specific details to look it up so i guess this has precedence and they they reference this stress as part of a possible cause from there from those three girls basically over the course of i think a few weeks to a couple of months this school actually got shut down because 95 out of 159 girls in that school started to experience this laughing sickness and there weren't any big discernible patterns as far as what they could tell caused the laughing problem, except for contact. It was simple, you know, this person's been around this girl who had this issue two days ago, and now uh, this 
other girl is laughing hysterically and she can't help herself. But the thing about this was it wasn't just contained within the halls of the school. This spilled over to home life. These girls would go home and the laughing fits would continue and it would become, air quotes, contagious outside of the school as well. Yeah. And so that school was shut down for a few months. Um, they did reopen, but by that time, uh, some of these girls who had been sick and were now fine actually went back to their hometown. And this is in several different cases as well. But the first instance of this outside of the school was about 55 miles away in a place called Nishamba, I believe it's pronounced. But several of the girls from Kashasha had returned there that was their hometown and in that village there was an outbreak that lasted between april and may and out of the 10,000 population there it was reported that 217 people had contracted this laughing disease which is ridiculous if you can imagine 217 people in the space of a couple of months just laughing uncontrollably i mean what are you going to do how do you how do you treat that so how did they treat it they didn't from what i can tell they didn't everybody was confused and scared and had no idea what to do in fact later on at the end of that article in the journal there is a discussion made but they don't have any solutions. I think his conclusion is that they just have to watch and wait and see because nobody is dying from this. It's not like the dancing plague of 1518 where people are dropping dead. People are recovering. It's just, you know, it's not a fun experience to go through when it happens. So they just have to watch and wait. And it's breeding fear among the community, which is then in turn creating more episodes that you just have to wait it out. Yeah, it truly became an epidemic. Um, from there, from Nishamba, on the outskirts of Bukoba, between June 10th and 18th, 48 girls out of 154 girls also contracted the disease at the Ramachenye school. I may be saying that wrong, but another school basically has this issue and they are also forced to close. Um, about 20 miles from Bukoba, another outbreak happens when one of the pupils of that school is sent home on June 17th. You know, there's one more day going on over in the other place, but she's sent home. And as we see unfold, her sister, her brother, her mother-in-law, and then the sister-in-law of her father all started contracting the laughing fits as well. I think the sister-in-law, it was an interesting case because she she had walked 10 miles just to come see her and check, you know, to see how the sick girl was doing. And she ended up going home with the same issue happening. And, you know, some people might try to say, well, it's easy. It's a bunch of schoolgirls just carrying on a goofball prank. You know, they're just being silly. Folks, it's very difficult to sustain something like that at that level for that length of time. And then take it outside of a concentrated area to a wider area and not just one other area outside of the school, but many areas very difficult to prank that out for that length of time. Oh, no doubt. And, and and think back as well. This is in the 1960s, and we talked about two girls' schools closing. At that same time, two boys' schools also closed. So you're talking four schools at least that we know of actually shutting down for at least a couple months at a time. This affected not just individuals as far as their, their daily lives and going through this traumatic event, but it also shut down schools to the point where it was messing with the education and the jobs of the community. So it was a huge ordeal back then. And apparently a lot of people were um, stricken with fear at this possibility happening to them. It wasn't just a matter of people were laughing and then getting over it. It was a thing of this is, you know, putting a pause on our lives and it's hurting our community. So the, the author of that medical journal was basically going through different possibilities of, you know, what might have caused it. The only thing that was really brought up as far as like a physical possibility was that this disease was being passed into the eyes as little droplets of either spit or water, as if something was spreading that way. But that was almost quickly dismissed as he started talking about mass psychogenic illnesses. Um, and he listed off a couple other things at the time. It's interesting, one of the things that he brings up actually is a revival in Kentucky. 
And he starts talking about how they were uh, barking like dogs and going through a lot of the the things that we see happen in revival sometimes. I was going to say a lot of this reminds me of both the dancing plague and the laughing epidemics remind me a lot of what has happened within spiritual or religious communities over the centuries. And I'm not going to point out any one specific because I'm not here to say, hey, this happened here or this happened there. For the purpose of this conversation, I do believe that there are people who have genuine spiritual experiences, but then there are those that I would categorize either as showmanship or illness and some type of mass hysteria or like in the case of the laughing epidemic, something that is bred by fear or expectation that is then fostered within that community and nearly, nearly uncontrollable. And the level of suggestibility and even compliance is unheard of when something like this begins to break. But in some religious and spiritual communities, we've seen epidemics, we've seen instances where entire congregations or groups of people, like you said, this uh, Kentucky revival referenced, people begin barking like dogs, they begin dancing uncontrollably, they begin flailing about the description of people speaking in tongues, and not just from a genuine spiritual experience that has been described in certain religions, but one that is indiscernible, as though I've, I've literally heard people say, we're literally speaking the language of angels and demons. And you go off into that kind of stuff, you go off into people starting to act like animals, you go, you have people into laughing fits, into crying fits, and sometimes these events go on for years. And I believe, not all, and, I, and I'm not pointing fingers again, I'm not here to do that, but I do believe some of those would fall into the category of an MPI, a mass psychogenic illness. And it's interesting because a lot of those revivals, I do agree that some of them are based on fear, but a lot of them are very voluntary. And not all of them are based on fear, but I, I believe there's a whole different level of expectation. Right. That is, is different from fear that some of these things are based on. Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that some people are going to these places voluntarily and expecting that they're going to, you know, go through this. Obviously, things like the dancing plague and the laughing epidemic, those are not things, those are things that they might expect to mm -hmm. have, but they're definitely not things that people wanted to have or things uh, that people voluntarily signed up for. Well, and, and in some of these religious or spiritual contexts, we do have people who've come forward and said, I went in as a non-believer. I went in as somebody who didn't believe. I went in to prove them wrong. I went in with zero expectation and so to speak, I got bit. <laughs> and it happened to me too. Right. There there's a level there's still if you go into that situation with a with with an attitude that I don't believe this is real, I'm going to go in to prove it wrong. It's kind of weird. It's like opening up a different door. It's like opening up a different suggestibility that still leaves you vulnerable to whatever's going on, whether it is a social context or a true hard-boiled illness that's going on like some of these other incidents. Yeah. So it's, an, it's a very interesting thought. And to me, it makes me stop and question expectation versus desire. Fear versus, uh, I guess, what would be the opposite of fear? I guess people... Joy or elation. Yeah, um, I guess that would be where, where the freedom, Tarantism... almost. Where the Tarantella comes into play is people experience some of that joy in the music versus this fear that you have in the, the laughing epidemic. Yeah. I wanted to make another point as well. It, it's interesting. The author in that journal also referenced another MPI in 1787 in Lancashire. There's a cotton factory worker who I guess was deathly afraid of mice and rats. And one of her co-workers took a mouse and she placed it upon the woman's neck. That woman that was afraid of mice started convulsing and had several Several of these violent fits and episodes for the next 24 hours. So that's that's one person going through obviously a, a bad reaction. You know, I'd imagine you would do the same thing if I put a spider on your neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Well, you, uh, would, you would be in a great deal of pain <laughs> for an extended period of time too. So this was not like a, a study that they did on purpose, but 
somebody uh, went in and studied what happened after the fact. Um, and according to that study done at the time, the next day, three other women were having uh, similar fits as the girl who had the mouse put on her neck. And by the fourth day, according to this document, around 24 people had been affected in total, including a, a, uh, a male worker who had been trying to restrain some of the more violent women who were going through fits. And I guess he had become so exhausted that he himself was thought to have succumbed to this problem. Now from here, none of these people went to work for other cotton factories, but other cotton factories started hearing wind of this thing happening. And this rumor started to spread that there was cotton poisoning going around. And so other people started having these same similar fits in other cotton factories around that same time. And um, the author makes an interesting case for this sympathetic side of MPIs, that people start to see or come in contact with people who are experiencing these very traumatic, very extraordinary fits or symptoms. And so they themselves are so affected mentally or emotionally that they take on those symptoms as well, which it kind of works or it kind of helps explain one of the possible causes of the laughing epidemic. Still not sure what caused the, the original three girls to start laughing uncontrollably, but with this amount of stress and fear about grades and upbringing happening at the time, and these three girls just start going nuts with laughter, it all compounds to where, sympathetically, it spreads. And I think a lot of MPIs fall under that, that bracket. So just some really bizarre happenings um, in history with regards to these MPIs. It really fascinating to see the influence on the human mind and even the human emotion, if you will, the human heart and what that would cause us to do in any given circumstance. I wonder how much of this same influence or psychology, if you will, plays into anything that we have going on into the world today, even not necessarily with regards to an illness per se, but let's say these crowds of people gathering together and and reacting and responding to certain stimuli, uh, even if it's for a short period of time. I wonder if it if it's the same trigger, the same mechanisms, the same psychology at play here as a mass psychogenic illness that could be carried on for, for weeks or months or years at a time. Well, I think going back to what we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, going deeper into the, the root of the word monster, I would kind of agree with that um, and take it a step further saying that even if people are not experiencing MPIs these days, it's something to keep in mind um, when you're in a crowd like that or uh, when you're in an event like that, so that you're not susceptible to anything that might come of it, um, any crazy stuff that might happen. Yeah, and I think it even goes beyond simple crowd psychology or the theories surrounding that. I, I think it goes deeper than that. But as well, I believe some of this could be a response to the state of the world around us, you know, especially if it's a short term reaction to something, but the stresses of the world around a given group of people can certainly cause a reaction within that group that could have the same symptoms or the same look and feel of an MPI, though it may be short term. And it's just interesting to me to try to, to look into something like that and, and say, man, these groups of people, these crowds of people that are going through the same experiences because of the stressors put on them or the influences or the suggestibility that's been placed upon them or, or opened up to them. And here they are exhibiting the same behaviors, whether based on fear or expectation. Yeah. And how much of that is it comes through in spiritual and religious contexts so well as well. Well spiritual and religious contexts and also cultural contexts. It's I think it's important to note that a lot of MPIs seem to be based on a culture, heavily based on the culture around you as well. Uh, there's one MPI, one mass psychogenic illness that actually has occurred several times throughout history in different places, or I guess you would call it a category of an MPI, but it is where a crowd of people, I guess a, a, a percentage of the population starts to believe that their genitals start to shrink into their bodies. And these don't actually happen, but people start to believe that they will die or experience great pain because 
you know, their body parts are going to shrink up into their body. But that's cause for great fear. It is a cause for great fear. <laughs> it's and it could certainly cause fear to spread. So I can yeah. see where that would cause a lot of people to go nuts. But it's interesting to note that this particular type of of mass psychogenic illness has happened in several different cultures around the world and at different periods in time and history. But there are specifically cultures that put a heavy emphasis on reproduction and mm. your value as a human being to the world in your ability to reproduce and um, have children. So it's something that is culturally tailored to you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also something to keep in mind with these MPIs. Yeah. Another funny story. I don't know if I've, I think I've told you about this before, but I had a friend who is involved in one of those religious communities um, several years ago who invited me to attend an event with him kind of more as a, as a support to him because this was something he was involved in as a guest, an invited guest. And he asked me to come along. Ends up that this um, service, if you will, erupted into this dogs barking, dancing, flailing, crying, laughing hysteria that night. <clears throat> and he happened to be up like in the central part of the stage when all of this stuff started breaking out around him. And I'm sitting over here on the, the side of the audience and, and he looks at me and just starts mouthing to me help me do something. <laughs> and I'm looking around thinking, what do you want me to do? So I just shrug at him and he starts pointing at people and he's like, help me do something. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, this, this, uh, happening, these happenings kind of spread from the stage throughout the entire building. And before you knew it, you had Groups of people that were laughing hysterically, that were crying and consoling each other in the middle of the floor. You had people that were going down on all fours and starting to bleat like sheep and uh, bark like dogs. And I think the point where I actually did something was I saw this man drop down on the ground and he started slithering like a snake. His arms were down to his sides and he was literally slithering on the ground. It's not creepy at all. It, it wasn't. But the thing that really was bad is he made his way to me. And I ended up having this man start to slither between my feet on the ground. And I was just like, oh, no. <laughs> so I looked down at him and I just said, listen, sir, get up. Get up and take your seat. And he stopped. And he looked up at me. And he's like, what? And I was like, get up and get out from under my feet and go sit down. And he did. He promptly stood up and he was angry about it. He was very upset as though I had disrupted this experience for him. And he went and he sat down. But I really didn't care at the time because I did not want him disrupting my feet anymore <laughs> that night. But <clears throat> this whole building, I, I mean, I had experienced it firsthand. This whole building had just erupted in this this craziness. And my friend up there, he's like, help, help. You know, I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> You know, and afterwards, uh, I think a few days later, I had lunch with him or something. And he's just like, man, it just, it got out of control. You know, he said, I, I know that there are people who have very spiritual and great experiences, but that was not one of them. That was a group of people that were just feeding off of each other and they went bananas. So I've seen the kind of thing that we're talking about happen up and close and personal on a very limited and short term scale. And I can tell you that there was a, a certain energy in the room that if you were not aware and unwilling to be drug into it or be a part of it, it could easily sucker a lot of people into that. And I could see how, you know, some of these other, like the Kentucky revival you spoke of earlier, there was another one down, I think in Florida, there was one out in California in the early 1900s, I believe, how these things would continue continue for days and weeks and years on end, it'd be real easy, you know, to attract groups of people to that and continue that uh, for an extended period of time. But I, I wasn't having anybody slither through my feet that night. <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with that.
I can't say I blame you on that one. So there you have it, folks. Mass psychogenic illnesses, some really strange things going on in the world. Michael, I guess my question on this would be, what warning do we have out of this? You know, you go back to the origin of the word monster being an omen or a sign or a warning. Sometimes I, I think this kind of behavior reflects the world that we live in, and particularly here in the United States right now. We see a lot of political and social upheaval and even spiritual upheaval. You know, I wonder if things like this happen during times like that for a culture or a country, a city, you know, a, a congregation of people where they're going through some form of upheaval or high stress and this is just a sign of the times, so to speak, to say we need a change. We need to get our stuff together and figure out a different way because this is starting to affect us at a level that is very deep and it's going to have long-term effects if we don't get it right. Um, I think you you said it earlier, talking about that, that last story, yeah, just an awareness. Um, I feel like a lot of these MPIs are, again, based on a very heightened emotional response, and I think there are times to have high emotions. I think even in those times to have high emotions, though, I don't think you should let your guard down enough to get sucked into laughing hysterically or dancing to death. And I'm using that metaphorically, but if that happens literally, you know, don't dance to death either. Sure. Man, you know, it makes me long for a good goth club. <laughs> I haven't been to one in a long time. There, I don't think we have any around here, but man, that would be fun. Uh, I miss those days. All right, so there you go, folks. TheMonsterGuys.com is where you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just look us up at The Monster Guys. Chat with us. Talk to us. Tell us your thoughts. Have you had any experiences with mass psychogenic illnesses or just crazy people slithering through your feet? I don't know. Just Or the Tarantella. Or the Tarantella. Yeah, we need to find some of that music and, and play it. That That's some pretty intense and frenzied tunes right there. I, I think I have a couple that I can send you. Yeah, maybe we can link something like that in the show notes or something, a, a video or something for people to see. It'd be fun. Contact us, folks. Continue the conversation. It's great to be back with you. We've got some cool episodes coming up in December. And of course, look forward to our list of newly to be inducted honorary monster guys and gals for 2017 happy to be sharing that list with you and i think many of you have been with us on the podcast from the beginning are going to nod your head a very big yes that some of these people deserve it big time so we're glad to to do something like this it, it makes us happy until next time stay away from spiders <laughs> and if you feel like dancing just stay indoors stay indoors and do your thing all right good night folks good night